So welcome to our second session uh, of the course Product and Business Planning of the Master Course. Um, last week, uh, we stopped talking about the business model canvas invented by Alex Osterwalder and his team. And we uh, already mentioned that first step is to identify the customer segments you want to address with your products and services. In the second step, in the second phase, we have the value propositions. And when it comes to the value propositions, you have to identify those value propositions. We call those the CVPs, customer value propositions. You have to identify those for each customer segment you are addressing. So here is the definition of the value proposition. It describes the bundle of products and services that create value for a specific customer segment. So the focus should be on specific customer segment because you don't have one value proposition normally that appeals to all customer segments, but with respect to the customer group, you have different um, value propositions. Using the example of Lego, we already said that, for example, there can be many customer groups, for example, children being one and also retail. Online and offline retail, so bricks and mortar, as well as online shops such as Amazon. And for each of those customer segments, Lego has to create a different value proposition. So in the end, they have CVP1 addressing uh, customer group 1 and they have CVP2 appealing to customer group 2. So that is the logic and that is why in the first step we are thinking about the customer segments and in the second step we are thinking about the value propositions. The key questions are listed on the slide. Um, they are mentioned here. So first of all, Which value do we deliver to which customer group? And the second one, which one of our customers and their problems and challenges are we helping to solve? Now, that is a very important uh, and, and I, I think one of the most fundamental concepts um, of, uh, of all times when it comes to identifying um, innovations or potential innovations and new cool products that appeal to people because um, I can talk for hours about the topic. Um, there is a nice uh, saying uh, and the quote I'm always um, pinpointing at in this respect coming from Henry Ford and Henry Ford said if I would have asked my customers what they wanted they would have asked for faster horses. So if you go out and ask customers or potential customers what they want which kind of computer which kind of a smartphone which kind of a car you get a dull answer because customers are sometimes unaware of their real rational behind the selection. But what customers always know is what their problems are with current products and services, what their challenges are. And if you help to tickle those and to dress those with um, clever products and services, basically the customer realizes that his or her not only needs but problems are being uh, solved through your services, through your products. And that is the best thing you can do because then the customer automatically realizes that the value proposition is appealing to him or to her. And um, the last one, which bundles of products and services are we offering to each customer segment? Because you may offer a different kind of product different kind of be, being bundled with a different kind of service to the respective customer segment you're talking towards. Let's look at this in a bit more depth. So these are the characteristics of great value propositions. And I listed on the slide. You can use this checklist to design and create value propositions for your own company. So they are embedded in great business models, of course. 
But that is the key point I was just turning towards. They focus on pain relievers. So uh, products and services need to make things easier for the customer. So that, that is a pain reliever if you solve a problem or you deliver superior value. But you do those extremely well. Focus on jobs, pains or gains that a large number of customers have. That is, by the way, the, um, the prerequisite also for clever segmentation. Of course, you can segment a market. You can build many, many, many different customer segments. There are. But the segments you are creating should be big enough in order to be worthwhile to be addressed with a specific individual value proposition. That is the key thing here. For example, uh, to paint a bit black and white and to be exaggerating a little bit, we may say, okay, uh, we are BMW and um, I don't know, uh, our target group is the 20 to 21 year old um, female uh, car enthusiast who, is, uh, who has studied at Harvard University, but left after two semesters uh, to study at INSEAD and is now working as uh, a medical assistant in uh, Colombia. Ah, maybe <laughs> there's one lady in the world. <laughs> and we can, of course, we can tailor our value proposition to that specific person. However, it's not worthwhile doing because <laughs> that, is, that is only too small of a segment here. You get the point. So that is the, um, the third point here. Focus on jobs, pains, gains, value propositions that address a large number of customers. Align with how customers measure success. So it has to be clear to the company and to you what uh, kind of circumstances do customers uh, perceive as uh, being a success. For example, for example, which kind of um, feeling do they need to have um, to make, uh, I don't know, feeling troublesome uh, is going away. So, so what, what needs to be done in order to solve their problems? Focus on the most significant jobs, most severe pains, most relevant gains. You cannot focus on everything. Just pick out one problem uh, for example, and then ta ta tailor your offering to that specific problem. Look what is already out there in the market. Who's already in the market uh, addressing this kind of a problem? For example, if people now, um, very uh, realistically speaking, which kind of problems do they have right now? A lot of things are being closed and uh, even though some kind of institutions such as, uh, such as fitness uh, studios, they have hygiene concept, they are being shut down. However, uh, now what do people do? What challenges do they have now? What, what, what may be a business idea derived out of that? which already existed now, but, oh, but what, what, is, what is the challenge of people if they're interested in sports? So they cannot go to the usual fitness studio anymore. So probably uh, that is a problem because they want to work out. Okay, they can run, uh, but they cannot uh, train uh, with the, um, I don't know, with certain kind of weights, etc., etc. So um, a solution to that may be um, online courses, um, but they are existing already, of course, but what is the issue of and what are the problems and challenges of people who try to remain fit watching videos, paid or non-paid ones, doesn't make any difference. For example, they don't know whether they're executing them in, in, the, in a meaningful, in a proper way. So a solution to that may be that um, you focus on uh, a small target group here, um, but being very profitable um, and offer one-on-one uh, -on -one coaching, one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions, not, not, not just videos uh, to be sold to hundreds and hundreds of people being unable to go to fitness studios, but 
Now, a one-on-one -on -one coaching could be one. I'm just talking out, uh, outside of the box. You need to address functional, emotional or social jobs, right? Or a bundle of all those together. <clears throat> then outperform competition substantially on at least one dimension. So, for example, you offer a superior, superior function that, that others are not offering. Then, and this is probably the most difficult thing to do, um, a value proposition should ideally be difficult to copy. But that is problematic because uh, more and more uh, things can in fact be copied. So that is very, very challenging here. You can also focus on unsatisfied jobs, pains and gains, so which have not been addressed before because uh, companies are not so much aware of that. So, summing that up, what values are created with a particular product or service range from one or more customer segments? Main issues are which values are we creating for the target groups and which problems and tasks can we solve for the target group? And with a particular service or product, we are, we can create the following values. So we can have a completely uh, new kind of novelty here. Frequently addresses a need of the target group, which is not yet aware. So which has not been addressed before. So you're addressing a new kind of problem. And you're the only one who's doing that. Performance. Improvement of product. Or service range for example there are already uh, I don't know repair services for computers out there however I don't know you, you may have uh, an additional feature that uh, makes repair services um, less time-consuming or make it easy to file or to get in contact with a uh, technician could be anything like that adoption to customer requirements the challenge is to create a specific tailor-made offering, taking account of specific segments and their needs, right? That is uh, a challenge. That is a challenge because you need to dive into um, depth when it comes to analyzing the customer groups. You need to be aware of their feelings, wants, needs, and in particular, like I said, problems. Facilitate the work for the target group. For example, by offering services such as, I don't know, a printing service, um, translation service, for example. You can approach authors and say, okay, you are a German author and um, we are an Indian company and uh, we offer translation services for your books or publishing services for your books in India at a, at a reasonable price. Design. This aspect is difficult to quantify, but particularly important part of the CVP, of the customer value proposition. For example, when it comes to entertainment or fashion, of course. Brand status, that is the emotional benefit. So the creation of value for the customer can also arise from the fact that he or she wants to show his status with a certain kind of a brand. Could be, I don't know, the, the usual suspects, Porsche, Ferrari, Rolex, uh, Giorgio Armani, whatever, right? So that is an expression, all of this is an expression of wealth uh, or wearing certain brands can be an expression of, uh, for skateboarders, for example, to be modern and tip. So that is precisely, for example, um, what uh, some, uh, Lifestyle brands uh, such as Quicksilver or Billabong uh, were doing successfully, by the way, successfully um, challenging the traditional brands that were not so much looking at one specific customer segment, but they were trying to target many segments with one value proposition. But that is precisely the point here in, in a good business model. Uh, of course, if you're Nike, you can try to, um, to have a one 
product and service fits all value proposition. However, um, I'm now I'm asking you if you want to want to want to get a cool, I don't know, swim shorts. Many people are then going for the specialists. So that they, they rather go to O'Neill or Billabong or Quicksilver than to Adidas or to Nike or to Under Armour. Um, and the same is with, uh, like I said, with skateboarders. Vans is a very popular uh, brand that popped up uh, a couple of years ago. And they are very, very successfully um, via emotional value propositions targeting a very specific segment. So with a particular product or service range, the following values can be created. Price as well. Value arguments can also be provided by free deals, low prices or very, very high prices. Cost reduction can also be a value proposition. So savings potential, for example. And I think one of the biggest drivers is uh, risk reduction because a lot of people are risk averse so if you manage to reduce the risk of the company uh, and the customers that could be done via offering a certain kind of warranty for example um, that is the strategy by the way also of uh, of amazon and also of paypal so they say if you if you're ordering that's the value proposition if you're ordering if you're paying paypal so let's assume you're buying a product at some kind of a company and you don't know the company uh, but it's a product it's, it's it's for example it's something like a tablet uh whether it's samsung apple doesn't make any difference and there's a good offer from some dealer but you haven't heard about him or her um and but they're offering paypal payment so you, you, paypal offers a risk reduction proposition so if you buy through paypal at this dealer you don't know your risk is being reduced which is of course um a big uh, a big point for some for some people right um availability making products or services available which certain customers were previously not obtained so um for example um you're making it available for the broad public to um to do uh trading when it comes to uh on the stock market so that is what uh what here robin hood is doing for example or all the internet brokers are doing so that is their basic cvp that they're opening so to say the financial markets to a broad public at a very reasonable price can also be Convenience, user comfort. So for some customer segments, values can be created through a particular user-friendly product design or just the ease of use. That was always at the heart of the Apple products. Even before the Apple iPhone came alive and came along, they had um, computers working seamlessly, easily together with the printers, etc., etc. So that was always their value proposition in particular, if you compare that to uh, to Microsoft, I'm not saying that Microsoft is less <laughs> is is more difficult to use, but that was the value proposition that that it all works seamlessly, um, easily, and you don't need big manuals. Therefore, they already very very early on they are not they were not printing manuals and they were not really giving big big manuals and instructions to come along with the, to go along with the product. So that is just by packaging also uh, a kind of a clever communication that your product is proposed or suggested to be very user-friendly. Now, there is um, a, a sub-map, a sub-canvas, um, and we call that the empathy map, the empathy map. You all know what empathy is, and the empathy map here helps to develop a better understanding of the customer by looking at the environment, behavior, concerns and aspirations you can you can see here that is the customer and we can look at each of the segments here what does the customer think and feel what really counts 
What are the major preoccupations, worries, aspirations? So what are they trying to, to do? What does the customer see, the environment, friends, what the market offers? And say and do, what does the customer attitude in public appearance, behavior towards others? Here you have the pains and gains. So fears, frustrations, obstacles and gains, wants, needs, measures of success. And hearing is, what does the customer, what friends say, what bosses say, what influencers say. So we need to understand very, very thoroughly uh, what are the reference groups, we call them, that have an impact on the buying decision of the final, um, of the final customers. So we know, for example, that when it comes to buying a family car, also the children have a great stake in the decision making which car and which brand to go for. So the empathy map helps to develop a more profound understanding of the customer segments we are trying to address by looking at the environment, behavior, concerns and aspirations. So how can we do that? First, brainstorm to come up with some interesting customer segments, which may be interesting customer segments. And Probably it's not that aware, but like we said last week, um, it all seems, uh, markets seem to be very, very saturated. Most markets seem to be very saturated because we have a lot of manufacturers, a lot of suppliers, a lot of companies, competitors in a given market. However, if you look from a, a different kind of angle onto the market, you may identify customer segments that have not been obvious. For example, I was giving the example last week. Um, Caterpillar was looking at the construction workers and, uh, and the smartphone market. Although you have Apple and you had uh, Nokia and Blackberry and uh, whatever, um, Samsung on, on the market, Huawei, Honor, etc., etc. Caterpillar managed to successfully step, tap into that market, but only when it comes to a specific niche, when it comes to a specific customer segment, longing for rugged phones, robust phones with additional features as well, a heat camera, for example, and super being super robust. Or the other company I was mentioning, Doro, um, building specifically phones, smartphones, mobile phones for elder people, for the elderly. So for people being age 70 plus, of course, 70 plus can also use iPhone, but sometimes people just want to make phone calls and be available. And they, I told you they have a specific emergency button. So that is a cool, cool thing. Um, so first try to identify potential customer segments, then choose three to five promising segments. You cannot choose everything, of course, and then narrow down the selection. And then you need to start a profile. Then you need to look into depth, precisely looking at the empathy map here. And then you can come out with cool innovations, cool innovations nobody ever thought about before. And that is how the digital giants are doing that as well. And then after you've done that, you, you identify the customer segments and you thought about the CVPs, the customer value propositions, you, uh, and, and, and you deeply look into that um, utilizing the empathy map, we can do and use Another canvas, which Osterwalder suggested, which I very much like, um, it is called the value proposition canvas. And what is the value proposition canvas about? What is it doing? Basically, you can see it on the slide. So it is precisely looking at those two building blocks, the customer segments and the value proposition, and then it's trying to match it. How does it work? It looks like that. So. Um, it is a kind of zoom in and uh, the value proposition canvas looks like that. So here you have the customer on the one hand side and here you have the company. And then you list and you do this, ideally speaking, most companies do that if they do it at all, but if they do, they do for all customers, which doesn't make any sense because you have to do this realistically and idealistically 
for every customer segment you're looking at. So you list the gains. What are the gain points for customers? What do they consider as a gain, as a value add? What are the pain points? What are the challenges? And what are customer jobs? So what does the customer want to do, want the product and service to do, right? Somebody is, um, I don't know, wants a mobile phone or a smartphone, uh, I don't know, to, 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 to work out, for example, um, or to, 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 to watch YouTube videos. Although other people just want to make a phone call. Other people want to do FaceTime. Other people want to check the email, but they're not using it as a phone. Uh, it depends. So what is the customer job? What does the customer want the product to do? That is very important. And then you look at the company perspective. You list here the game creators. Usually, ideally, what, what we do in, in, in workshops we have here stickers and we're putting the stickers here in a specific color. So for example, you're having here yellow one, you, have, you list certain kind of gain creators. And then you have here gains and then you do a matching and you say, okay, you should, you should not address every kind of a, um, of a gain here, but it's good to do a matching here. Also the same with the pain relievers. What are the challenges of, uh, of customers, of this customer segments, and what are your potential solutions? Yeah, probably you find out that, um, I don't know, there, there is, a, um, this one is very big here. There's a big pain point here, a big minus of this customer segment, and you don't have any solution for that. So you may come out with, um, if you run through the process of the value proposition canvas, you may come out with a cool idea for a new kind of pain reliever. It could be a, um, um, it could be a service, it could be a product, or it could be a bundle of a product or a service. So these are the products and services the company is offering. So basically, this is how the matching works between um, between the, uh, the customer segments and um, the value proposition. So here is very, very detailed, um, detailed description of what I just explained. So I, I, I go over that, but um, if you wanna learn more about the business model canvas here, about the value proposition, you can look in, into the study material. I shared also some um, further links here. But I was explaining just that before. Here is a um, <clears throat> quick summary again. Um, so list your products and services. Name your pain relievers, second step. Name your gain creators. And what is also useful to do, sort all elements according to their importance. Not when it comes to the importance as seen from the company, but as seen from the um, customer segment you're targeting. On the other hand side, for the value proposition, you need to choose a customer segment because you, you, you focused on three or four, but you choose one and then identify the customer jobs, like I just explained, then pain points, gain points, and sort all elements according to their importance. A very um, useful thing in this respect which uh, condenses this a little bit, makes it a, bit, a little, little bit more easy and reduces complexity, are ad-libs. Ad-libs, uh, they are a great way to shape alternative directions for your value proposition. Here you can see um, how ad-libs may help you. Our, and then you, then you list um, the products and services you want to describe. So our, for example, um, electronic uh, hoover boards or whatever, helps this customer segment who want to, and then you, you have the job to be done listed here, by, and then for example, you say, by reducing, avoiding whatever, and adding a customer pain point here, you wanna reduce, and for example, increase, and you add a customer gain point. And in brackets, you can also write, unlike 
I don't know, company XYZ is doing. That is that has proven to be very, very useful to come out with a compelling CVP in the end after you matched the customer segments and the value proposition. Next factor, the channels. That has been explained in the video as well. I can uh, only advise you to look at some of the videos on the YouTube on how to do business model canvas in order to get a better understanding. There are also some videos from the strategizer team. So these are the key questions. Through which channels do our customer segments want to be reached? How are we reaching them now? And how are our channels integrated? Which one works best? Which is most cost efficient? Shall we uh, switch it? How are we integrating them with customer routines, for example? Channels with whom one can obtain the targeted customer segments. These, are, these shall be listed here. Can be trucks, can be a web shop, um, whatever. So it includes also communication channels, distribution and also sales channels. So it could be Salesforce as well, if you have your own Salesforce. Main issues are by the use of which channels do we want to reach our target groups? And which channels are the most cost efficient, like we just like we just mentioned? Then customer relationships. In in this building block, in the fourth building block, you ask yourself the question: what type of relationship does each of our customer segments expect us to establish and maintain with them? Which ones have we established already and how costly are they? How cost intensive are they? And how are they integrated with the rest of our business model? And there are several categories or dimensions of customer relationships. One, dedicated personal assistance, so private one-on-one, -on -one. self-service. So basically there is no interaction here. Automated services, communities or co-creation. To sum it up, the block customer relationships describes the types of relationships a company establishes with the specific customer segment. So main issues are here, what kinds of customer relationships are expected? How cost intensive are they? We mentioned that. And which customer relationships are best suited to our business model? It can also be a value add or solving the problem of people to come um, to come across with a, a very superior service. So um, to, to, to help customers if they have any kind of problem with respect to whatever cooking, for example, it can be you can you can offer, I don't know, a, a cooking hotline. So when I was uh, with Professor Kotler in some uh, some countries abroad, um, I think also in uh, in Pakistan, we had that um there were um one businessman told me for example they had an idea of because a lot of people um when they're not feeling well um they they have the problem and challenge of getting an appointment with a doctor and they don't don't want to waste time they don't want to queue and they don't want to wait for an appointment so what what he did was he established a call center for potential potentially sick people so if you have not a big thing but um if you have some kind of i don't know weird feeling or a headache or something like fever um you there's an hot a hotline available a medical hotline and on the medical hotline is 24 uh 7 there are always doctors there are always doctors and you only have to wait 30 seconds for, for getting a doctor on the phone, on the line. And they're giving you first advice, first advice, not final treatment, but first advice, which kind of medicine you may take. And they're also able to, to write a recipe and, and email it to you. So that, that is interesting because um, that is a, <laughs> the need was there before. There, there are services being established by universities, by doctors. But um, this kind of a service was not existent. 
So that, that is an interesting thing. So suddenly a new kind of business model popped out of nowhere just because people were entrepreneurs. They were looking at problems of, um, of those kind of people and say, uh, how many people ha have those kind of problems? And if I have a problem, I call my friend who is a professor, who is a medical professor. So I call him and, and so I, I, I know uh, sometimes you, you want to just talk to somebody probably also quickly because you just have one question and uh, therefore you don't need an appointment with a doctor. So it's good, good if you have um, so-called a membership at this um, kind of a service with this kind of a company. Like I just said, there are the following types of consumer relationships here. Personal assistance based on human interaction. So that is what they offered. Uh, individual personal support, the most intensive intimate one a personal account manager is available for a customer and his support for example a bank offering support 24 7 for the most wealthy clients self-service is not a direct customer relationship but the company provides all prerequisites so the customers can help themselves like faq for example automated service self-service is realized with automated processes on the basis of historical data is also FAQ, for example, or communities, which is often offered also by big companies. Companies maintain communities and therefore achieve additional information about users as well. And participation, I, 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 said, uh, I, said, I said that before, so it's co-creation, possibility of writing customer reviews on not only consuming videos on video portals, but also to provide own films on the portal, enabling a participation in the value add. For example, what we can do and what is done by companies such as Bosch, uh, Bosch Professional Power Tools, they have a Facebook group and on the Facebook group they are sharing latest videos or also product development and they're asking the community being professional construction workers for example for their advice so they are asking oh, what is what is your problem main problem with our current portfolio of products is it getting too hard is it i don't know if you have slippery hands um is it, 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 do we need to improve the grip etc et and suddenly new kind of um levers pop up that haven't been obvious before. Five, revenue streams. This one here, of course, important as well. Everything is important because without revenue, you, you're becoming insolvent. So the block revenue streams represents the cash that a company generates from every customer segment. So for what value are our customers really willing to pay? Because it doesn't make sense to offer all kinds of services without being paid for that. So that can only be um, uh, a strategy if you want to accumulate in a short period amount of time a big bunch of customers to establish a relationship with them. For what do they currently pay? How are they currently paying? And how much does each revenue stream contribute to the overall revenue. That is a very important thing as well. That is a very important thing as well because it turns out that a lot of products, a lot of services in the portfolio are not paying off and uh, they're just kept, but there is no financial analysis. What is very useful in this respect is to do a financial analysis and to do uh, specifically what we call an ABC analysis. Probably you heard about that before um an abc analysis what is it a b c analysis um it groups products or services with respect to a certain kind of variable so what does it mean um very simply speaking i plot a diagram here we look at for example profits we look at profits and what is often realized um, by a lot of companies and that is just numbers here numbers um, and that here so it goes like that for example 
So that we, we, we can see that, uh, for example, here, saying like that, it's often found that 10% uh, of your product, sometimes you also read um, the 80-20 rule, so with 10% or 20% of your product, you're generating 80% of your profits. And then you have, for example, here, I don't know, another uh, 40 to arrive at this one here. You get the logic. So, um, that is, and these are these are a products here. These are a products or services can also be uh, a customers as well. B products and C products. So um, the logic is the logic is that um, normally with twenty percent of your products, you're generating eighty percent of your turnover or profitability. Then with another 30%, roughly speaking, there is no strict rule for that. You're generating a, an incremental 15%, arriving at 95%. And with 50% of the products and services being in the portfolio, you're only generating 5% incremental profits. So you should focus on the A products. Of course, you need to look at um, the, the, uh, the products and services very, very carefully because some products or also some customers if you group customers into a b and c you you have to ask yourself the question well why are you, why are the c customers why i'm not generating enough profits with those kind of customer groups maybe for example looking at you your students okay right now probably you are not the most affluent people also when it comes to investment however if you are well educated, and I hope I can contribute to that, you're getting a good job and you're, you're, you're paid above average, you're reasonably paid and you will have, um, I don't know, hopefully lots of money to be invested also in shares, in, in um, flats, in houses, whatever. So although you are now in the C segment, as far as customer segmentation is concerned, you may uh, move up uh, to become an A customer. So it is too static to just kill, automatically kill C products or C customers. But you also have to look at the potential development of products and services over time. However, what you have to do in any cases, whether you are a startup or you're an existing company, you need to check that carefully because this is very, very important. You need to focus your energy. You need to focus your investment. <clears throat> so you have the distinction between unique revenues through transactions and continuing revenues. And that is, in, 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 interestingly, that has become more and more important. These continuing revenues through regular payments of customers um, so this subscription model that um, you have uh, with apple tv or with uh, the spotify premium account or amazon prime video for example so you have a recurring revenue so maybe um, you have uh, increment or you have starting cost acquisition cost to get customers subscribing your your your, um, your channel your streaming service, whatever, your membership in, in, in a certain kind of a club or like this, the doctor call, call center. Um, but what you, of course, should look at probably if you keep, if you maintain the customers, this can be very, very interesting. This recurring um, benefits you're getting. So that sometimes this is a clever strategy not to focus on the transaction so to sell one product to a customer or one service to a customer but to sell a certain kind of product and service over and over and over again 
so you have recurring benefits over and we call that the customer lifetime value main issues are for what value propositions target customers are willing to pay are willing to pay of course in today's world a lot of um, mentality is out there that a lot of stuff should be there for free but offering services for free um, everybody can do so how how can you how can you generate income out of that because i assume that most startups of course are for profit corporations what form of payment is preferred by the target customer and these are the following re uh, revenue streams here and the available options sale of assets so one of the most important sources of generating cash the sale of the ownership of physical goods yeah you're selling cars houses cosmetics beverages etc user fee that is interesting yeah fees are charged on the use of a service also here is could be this recurring ones it's it's close to closely connected to member fees here here's hotel rooms um, member uh, member fees are a good example as well based on memberships fees will be charged so fitness studio for example fitness center but also online games such as world of warcraft and if you look at the business case of world of warcraft or fortnite it is amazing um just the in-game turnover of fortnite um last year was greater than one billion dollars the the in-game turnover of fortnite was greater than one billion dollars by far and um just its in-game turnover was so big that it was outperforming the three biggest hollywood blockbuster in the year 2019 that is interesting that is very very interesting so also, also that can be business models rental letting leasing contemporary and, and, and temporary transfer of an exclusive right for using certain assets for a fee rental fees for example then licenses the source of income allows the use of a protected intellectual property for example using specific media a patent a logo broker fees revenues can be generated by successful brokerage or sales transaction credit card for example here yeah, or for example um, uh, we mentioned that before PayPal is a good example for that and advertisement advertising revenues are received by the advertisement of products or service range for example in the media or entertainment industry six factor key resources the block key resources describes the most important assets required so how can you making your how which which are the prerequisites which assets to make the business model work to make it running so key questions are what key resources do our value proposition require and what key resources are required by our distribution channels customer relationships and revenue streams it can be physical intellectual human or financial here we have it physical resources all physical assets such as buildings machinery trucks interestingly in today's world of digitalization four of the most powerful companies in in, in this era are the gaffa companies i mentioned that before probably google amazon facebook apple all those all those companies they are not very very strong um, compared to other traditional companies such as exxon or shell or bank of america when it comes to physical resources but they have more and and and, and that is important intellectual resources the resources the assets they have those digital corporations sap ebay uh spotify are um intellectual resources they are intangible right patents data yes um information i said information information is the oxygen 
of today's world economy. Information is the oxygen, the oil of the 21st century. What was oil to the uh, 20th century, now um, information is, data is for the 21st century. And along with that, speed matters. Speed matters. Can also be financial resources, of course. Guarantees, cash, credit lines. I mentioned that this one here, intellectual and human resources. So they play, of course, a role for every company that you have uh, experts and professionals. But the intellectual resources, they play a more important role than ever before. In particular, if you think about uh, mega trends such as the Internet of Everything, blockchain, uh, whatever, 3D printing, etc., etc. Key activities. Seventh factor, the block key activities describes the most important things a company must do to make the business model work. So what key activities do our value propositions require? Not the assets, but key activities. Which ones do our distribution channels, customer relationships and revenue streams? These key activities can be distinguished and differentiated. Production, of course. Focus on the design, the production, and the delivery of goods or services, of course. Then problem solving. I mentioned that over and over again. Focus on the development of new and partially creative solutions for specific problems of users. Or platform. Activities relate to companies that operate platforms. Could be a brokerage platform, but it could also be a platform such as Amazon Marketplace or the iTunes Store. It was, I think, one of the most brilliant strategic moves of all time of any company, for example, to set up the iTunes Store. Um, because what is the iTunes Store about? It is a platform offering billions of apps or hundreds of millions of apps and programs and Apple is profiting from those, is getting a margin, quite a substantial margin, just by offering the platform. The platform. Apple is not, not, not really building thousands and thousands of apps, right? But they are profiting from each product and each app that is sold via the platform, from each song that is downloaded via the iTunes. And that also was, uh, was done by Amazon. Part of Amazon's power is coming from the Amazon Marketplace platform. And they opened the platform to all products, to all kind of companies offering products on the Amazon platform. Because that also helped them to, uh, to come out big when it comes to search engine optimization. Because no matter whether you're looking for a fridge or a hairdryer, um, you automatically find one on Amazon result and in the organic, um, in the organic results um, on uh, on Google or other search engines as well, not because necessarily Amazon or the dealer is paying for that, but just because it, it is most relevant and uh, they have uh, very, very strong backlinks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And eighth factor: key partners. The block key partners describes the network of suppliers and partners that make your business model work. So these are the key questions here. Who are the key who are the key partners and the key suppliers here? Uh, which key resources are we acquiring from partners? And which key activities do our partners perform for us? And uh, there are different types of partnership. One, strategic alliances between non-competitors could be one. So, for example, um, there is um, uh, a cooperation between Apple and Nike, for example, um, when it comes to fitness and having the uh, Nike Run Club NRC app on the uh, Apple Watch, for example. And they even have specific Apple Watches, Nike editions of Apple Watches, smartwatches. Uh, Co-opetition competition, strategic partnership between competitors. For example, if um, there is big investment needed 
in the electrical power driven car segment um, because BMW, uh, Daimler, they need to spend billions of dollars uh, in order to um, develop the batteries for electrical power driven cars. And therefore, it makes sense sometimes to join forces when it comes to the development, not necessarily of new engines, but just of key components such as batteries. Joint ventures to develop new businesses. A joint venture, do you know what a joint venture is? A joint venture is when um, one company A and another company B are setting up a company C and both usually hold 50% of the shares and both companies are still existent. Yeah. So for example, you can set up a joint venture um, also not only a strategic alliance, but re really a joint venture, a separate company to develop, for example, these uh, also alternative fuel, for example, biofuels. There can, can be a joint venture between, um, between the big oil companies, for example. Um, it can also be buyer-supplier relationship to ensure reliable supplies of products. I just mentioned that. Um, now, three motives can be differentiated when it comes to key partners. Optimization and volume advantage. So that is the possible optimization of the allocation of activities and resources. And optimization partnerships are very, very helpful if they contribute to cost minimization. That is a very, very uh, important thing. It is a trigger for partnerships. It could also be reducing the risk and uncertainty. So if you collaborate with other companies, including competitors, like I just mentioned, BMW and Daimler are doing that, uh, this can contribute to minimizing risks. Um, example, the Blu-ray, for example, several competitors jointly developed and launched the product. An all-in-one of a single company would most likely have failed. But because they joined forces and they um, brought out the product as a joint development, it was uh, successful. Um, acquisition of, uh, of certain resources and activities a concentration of core competencies is recommended. So a mobile phone manufacturer will not develop an operating system itself, could be, but instead acquire a license and focus on the development and production of the hardware. Of course, we know that Apple is developing their own iOS, but other companies, Samsung, for example, Huawei, they're not developing uh, Android, right? Um, it could be a strategy to look into that. Um, and also, this is what uh, what Apple did as well. When, for example, um, they moved away Google Google Maps from the uh, from the phone, it was no longer pre-installed. They 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 had to de develop that. They had to improve the Maps app on the iPhone. And what they did was they bought company being specializing in this uh, technology. Another uh, example is um, Apple, for example didn't develop Siri, they bought Siri. They bought Siri from, uh, from a company. And finally, the last building block being cost structure. So it describes all costs to operate a business model. Key questions are, what are the most important costs inherent in our business model? Which key resources, key activities are most expensive? And then we have different kind of uh, terminologies. Uh, I want to quickly touch, uh, touch based upon that. Um, there are fixed costs. They arise independent from production. So these are, for example, rents you pay for, um, for having a factory on a certain piece of land, for example. This is usually HR, personal, staff, overheads, staff uh, investment. Uh, variable costs are all the costs that go into the production of the product. Uh, depending on the product, could be aluminium or, I don't know, cotton, whatever. So they change in proportion to the scope of the produced product. And you can have volume advantages. With growing production volumes, companies can realize cost advantages based on lower volume purchasing prices. 
So for example, also here, this also links to relationships and key partnerships. If you have, uh, for example, a coalition with a competitor and say, okay, we are BMW, we are Daimler, and we are both purchasing our tires at Goodyear or Continental, Continental, Conti, um, we may join forces. And instead of uh, buying or ordering each of us 200,000 tires, per month or whatever, I don't know which number they're ordering, but we join forces and we buy 400,000. So we get a better price and then we divide it up, we split it up. And that, that is what we call volume advantage or the, um, the more precise definition for that would be, um, or a key term would be economies of scale. Economies of scale. So these are the volume advantages. Economies of scope is listed underneath. Economies of scope, they have a greater op operational um, bandwidth cost advantages here due to the possibility of sharing sales channels, distribution channels, etc., etc. So you have a bigger scope, for example, if you can sell through multiple channels. And that is the example uh, and I want to end here, but quickly let's look at that. That is the uh, the screenshot of the uh, of the Lego um, case and Lego example I was pinpointing at at the beginning, also in the last session last week. So we have here the segments of uh, the kids. Let's use a different kind of color now. Um, here are the kids as a customer segment, but also you have the retailers, like I just mentioned. And they identify here, for example, grandparents or parents as another customer segment here. And now what makes sense is to use different kind of colors here for the stickers and to have the corresponding ones here in the value proposition, because this is the first step. Then this is the second building block. And you see here for the kids, they have uh, creative uh, playing, building without limits, experimenting. So that is targeting the, uh, the children customer segment. For the parents, they have completely different value proposition. There is no, uh, here, there's more education, there's focus on education. It is a great present, useful one with a high quality, easy to buy. So that is directing towards the, um, the parents. And for the retailers, uh, being, being, uh, making Lego available in the shops is a traffic generator. So you increase traffic to the retail. It's uh, and Lego offers attractive point of sales material, for example. So these are these are the the matchings of the value propositions to the specific customer segments. Relationships here. You see, Lego is kind of a love brand. You ha they have the Lego Club as well to keep up relationships, and they have also the Lego Design by Me program. Then channels. They have online, of course. They have retail. But they also have uh, TV and uh, and movie also. So through these communication channels, for example, um, they have the Lego Star Wars. They have product placement in certain kind of movies. Uh, they have their own movies as well. So these are also channels. Remember, channels is not only trucks. It's not only retail, but it's also the the way of communication. Um, the uh, the core business here it's a production of uh, and development, of course the uh, on research and development as well, marketing and sales, distribution, and storytelling. Key resources are the brand, of course, designers, factories, and of course, the licenses they have. What are the partners? It's the entertainment industry, such as, I don't know, MGM and Sony and, and so on and so forth. Then game developers as well. If you think about the, the, um, the games for the Wii, all the games for the PlayStation, uh, then film producers and committed users. Cost structure. What is what is what is what are costs? Of course, salaries for people, production and development cost, marketing and royalties. Also, they have to pay because they have to pay big amounts of money. Also, for the partners, film industry here, for example, uh, to get. Um, their brand uh, being associated with Star Wars, Lego Star Wars, they have to pay for that, of course. What are revenue streams? The bricks itself, so the products, but also the movies and the merchandise. So that is 
roughly speaking, that is um, a very comprehensive business model here. The business model canvas being pre-populated using the example of Lego. Okay, um, I want to end the transmission here, but I, but I stay in the line, but I just end the transmission and the recording here. Thanks very much for your attention. Cheers, and I see you for another video uh, after this one. Cheers and bye-bye.